few years back, I had the idea that I wanted to talk about cults. I've always been fascinated by cults. You know, if I read a newspaper, <laughs> there's all the important news. If there's an article about a cult, I always rush to read that. I find them intriguing. And there was a particular reason um, that I wanted to make this series, and that was because on Netflix there was a movie called Holy Hell about a cult in California called Buddha Field, which uh, seemed to be a rather wonderful cult, um, offering a lot to its members, but eventually turned nasty. Now, the movie was made, uh, came out in 2016. It was done by a person called Will Allen, who'd been a member of the cult. And in fact, uh, although the movie as a whole was an investigative thing, which actually looked into the downside of the cult, um, quite honestly, um, to start with, it all looks absolutely wonderful. The reason being is that um, when he joined the cult, he was a bit of an amateur filmmaker. And so he became the sort of the video recorder for the cult, uh, filming a lot of their wonderful activities and everything and um, making movies. So it all looked very, very good. I don't think he was being dishonest. Um, you know, he loved the cult and therefore he showed the lovely bits of the cult. But that was the raw material for at least half of the movie, which meant that you you know you could get halfway through the movie and think this is brilliant. What's well, where's the hell? Well, um, why was it so attractive? Well, there are all these big crowd of beautiful people, women in bikinis and, and dancing in the surf, you know, and um, holding hands and laughing. It all looks like heaven to me. Um, and in fact, you know, if you're brought up in England in the cold, wet weather of Britain, uh, either you get used to it and love it, or else, if you're like me and a lot of other British people, you spend your winters dreaming about hot, sunny beaches like this and this sort of lifestyle. So I looked at it and I thought, oh, wow, you know, this is terrific. And it's absolutely captured by one of the early interviews of the thing, one of the people who joined it. You know, why did he join it? He said, these people were so alive. I wanted a bit of that. And that's exactly what I felt. You know, wow, who wouldn't want to be part of this group? Now, there was a person, in, um, a master in charge, who was a bit of a poseur, but a very sort of beautiful looking person. And so it um, became clear that uh, they depended very much on his teachings. Now, it wasn't just the, the physical pleasure of all these activities and that. He also, um, he was a hypnotist and he could give people an extraordinary spiritual experience, sort of resting his hand uh, on their head. And they came away saying, wow, it was like taking LSD, these visions of lights, things. It was amazing. Now, not everyone had that experience. But that doesn't come over early on in the movie. It sounds as though, you know, they not only have a wonderful lifestyle, but these brilliant spiritual experiences have been given. So, um, where's the hell? Well, it certainly became hell later on. Um, in about uh, 1992, the, the, there was the Waco um, tragedy, you know, where um, the Branch Davidians um, ended up uh, having a shootout and a lot of people being killed. And so there was a lot of anxi public anxiety about cults. And in fact, there was a sort of cult buster movement. And this man was very frightened of that um, because he felt that's where the paranoia came in. He thought that they were after him. And so what he did was he um, split them up, sent them to different places, I think three different groups, fragmented, while he went looking for a safe bolt hole. And eventually he found it in um, Austin, Texas, a sort of lonely ranch or something and then he brought them back together uh, but what was interesting to me was that um, and it was sort of the first dubious sign um, that I saw in the movie was that when he said I'm going to um, 
leave you and go and look for a place. They were saying things like, Oh, don't leave us. We can't live without you. Now that could sound very positive, but for me it was a bad sign because it suggested addiction. You see, when you have a cult which offers so much and offers a certain spiritual enlightenment, you like to think that the people in the cult have been strengthened. They are stronger people because of what they have gained from the cult. But this was looking more like that they were addicts. They couldn't live without it. Now the other um, un unpromising sign, shall we say, is that the guy who was making these movies became a favourite, very much part of the inner circle, which meant that he dedicated his life to the master. And uh, in this small group of people, one of their dedications was to let the master bugger him. Now, <laughs> that sounds like an instant negative. Of course, there is the argument, well, it's between consenting adults. What's wrong with that? But I've got to come back to that later, because it's an important point. So, um, looking for signs that there was something wrong with this cult... The most obvious thing is you look for signs of lockdown, you know, the locked door. What, why do people not leave the cult if, they, if they're unhappy with it? Or simply because, you know, their family demands or something takes great priority. And uh, one of the early interviews was with uh, a man who did go out to work and everything. You know, um, are you allowed to go out to work? Oh, yes, yes, I, I go out and earn a living and that and I'm... I come back in the evening. Oh, so it looked as though there wasn't any sort of um, lockdown. There wasn't any ban on going out. You could be part of the world. Now, um, in later interviews, uh, after the movie was made, there were some, several interviews um, where you found out a bit more about the background. And they, one person explained that Yes, you could, uh, particularly in the early days, you could go out and earn a living and um, apparently go out into the world and then be welcomed back into the cult. But he said that the cult was so much the centre of their lives that you didn't really go out and interact with the world. You went out, earned a living, and then rushed back to the cult. That was the only thing that was real. It was so dominant in their lives so it wasn't you it was a much more subtle form of actually being locked in you know um you could in theory go out and do things in the world but it's like their minds their souls weren't there they were all back in the cult so that was interesting to me because that's one of the obvious things you look for in a cult is you know are the doors locked so what, what was the addiction? You're given this wonderful carefree life with a taste of spirituality in it too. And when people said we can't live without you, it seemed to me as that um, what he'd given them was childhood. The innocence and playfulness of being children. And... Um, you see, when people eventually did split up and leave the cult, and some of them interviewed afterwards, uh, well, the person who made this movie, when he left the cult, he was quite disoriented. Um, again, it wasn't that he'd gained so much from the cult that he went out into the world a strong person who was able to make his way. He was like a little child, you know, um, confused, uh, frightened even. Um, and it was difficult, very difficult to adjust to normal life. And that seemed to fit to me the idea that this person really had um, kept them as children, which is a wonderful state to be in, but not a really nourishing, strengthening state. You see, on this question of, um, you know, were they consenting adults when 
he was buggered by the master. He later said in an interview, in theory they were, they were both adults, but the relationship was between the, the people and the master was like a father to child relationship, really. And so, um, they were, in a way, there were no more consulting adults than um, a little kid whose uncle is going to sexually abuse them. You know, your uncle that you're in awe of and you've been told you must um, hold in great respect is now making this demand. And he said it was like that. You know, you sort of really divided. Of, in a way, you felt it was a great honor, but you didn't feel you could refuse. It was because you were in awe of the person. So, um, what what is the learning from this? Well, to me, one of the things I wanted to, to, that inspired me to talk about cults was I'm always interested in the rather special relationship between magic and religion. In some ways, they have so much in common, but I'm always aware of the, the distinction. And one I've often made is that, um, on the whole, in religion, you're going from the earth up to spirit. Uh, you might kneel in front of a statue of a saint, but the idea is that you do that in order to be taken up to spirit. Whereas in magic, on the whole, you're bringing spirit down into the world. So, you know, sanctifying a crystal or something, you are making what was just a piece of quartz into a power object. You're bringing down spiritual power. So that's one thing, the direction. But the other thing, very fundamental, is that a magic is very much about the individual experience, whereas religion is about the group experience and the group mind, which is like the egregore in terms of an earlier talk I gave. So um, if you take part in a group ritual, magic ritual it is an act of magic but really it's what it does for each person is the main thing and that the sort of group experience of it the religious part of it is very nice but it isn't really the magic bit which is what it does for you now you see that's one of my criticisms of this group that um here were people having wonderful time their lives being opened up. They were feeling freer than ever, even though they were in the cult. Uh, they were f experiencing joy, which they just didn't feel in the real world. And they were even having these sort of spiritual experiences. But instead of ma la making them to stronger people who could stand on their own better because of all this gift they'd taken in, they actually became like addicts or helpless children. And so that's um, a particular point that I want to look at in uh, the following uh, movies. Now, the next one, the next video, I'm going to look at a very different cult, a British cult, where the gift was not so much of joy as of awe, a real sense of awe. And then third movie, I'll look into how to make a cult. <laughs>